Hello and welcome. I'm Corinne Little and I'm director of Out of Sight Chicago, the public performance series. And today I am with Faresh Day 2Z. And I wa first want to uh, share, when I first moved to Chicago um, for the second time in 2009, I went to a performance event and Faresh Day's performance in that event has really stuck in my mind and my memory and it was this installation performance where the audience was blindfolded and we got carried through this like forest-like atmosphere with birds and there was textures we could feel like gravel which was cat litter i think and uh, eat some berries and then we were told this story and it was all a very um you know sensory experience and that's what uh we're really we're going to be talking about uh in when we speak with Faraj Day today, and you'll see it in the performances that we're about to show. Um, to introduce uh, Faraj Day, um, her artworks foster animistic connections through outdoor encounters, exchange, and sensory inquiry. In Faraj Day Tuzi's water radio performances that was awarded the Ellie's Creator Award from the Olight Arts, uh, participants were, are invited to play a water conductivity uh, sound circuit, test sea plants, make rubbings and mang of mangrove bark and feel the resistance of water on their skin drawing attention to ways that human culture and geography are entangled sh shifts the audience capacity to notice, to witness, and transform these intersections. For Day's current project, Oil Ancestors, that we screened as part of the Out of Sight program in collaboration with Experimental Sound Studio on October the 1st, is a playful, immersive performance haunted by fossil spirits, ocean garbage, and the ruthless toil ty oil tycoon Henry Flieger, among others. The project is inspired by Faraj Day's experience as a first-generation immigrant of Iranian and Azari heritage. The legacy of petroleum imperialism and conflict also impacts many parts of the Caribbean, South and Central American countries that are represented among the immigrant residents of Miami, where Faraj Day lives. And her, this, you know, in the conversation that I was creating in the advertisements, I was really talking about how Faraj Day creates these um, experience, these embodied experiences in as we experience nature so she's kind of bringing us closer to nature uh, through these um, sensory uh, experiences and i'm going to show the first um, video that i'm going to show was a piece that she did for out of sight in 2015 and it's entitled lithium diaries Thank you. 
them in the basement. Oh, I asked what was in the batteries, and she said, I don't know, chemicals and like lithium. And I was like, okay. And I was like, so what, like, if I needed to replace the battery, uh, what would that involve? And she's like, yeah, you just bring it here. And, you know, we encourage people to bring batteries, not just of Apple products, but of like PCs and that sort of thing, because we do recycling. And I was like, and like, what happens once it like leaves here? And she's like, I don't know. Um, I remember taking some old computer stuff, and then I had to go back like, a few days later, and they had been scavenged. It's like, oh, it, you know, they like tried to take the parts of metal, oh. yeah, parts of the hard drive, or, you know, whatever. I thought it was weird that everything was just sitting out in the open. Yeah, it's almost like I just wanted it to just disappear, <laughs> like. You gone from the yeah, like, plane. Like it was just you know, it was still it's in your still journey. there. Like you mean like the plastic is just like, always great, great. So this you is a relaxation tea. This is a very soothing <laughs> relaxation <laughs> tea or tea. The reason why I wanted to share the tea with you today is because um, actually we've been you know we've been thinking about you know, lithium and electronics at the store, and I want to hear a little bit about what you discovered. But also, um, lithium was used in uh, beverages at the turn of the century uh, because people understood lithium to be a uh, mood stabilizer and, and relaxing agent. I would like for you to message her about your mood right now. Um, we did have this calming, relaxing tea, but I don't know if it's taken effect. If you don't have a lot to say, you can just think about the, your mood um, on a scale from uh, 1 to 10, with 1 being low, um, 10 being high. To, to, to wrap up, I have some images that I've made while I was traveling, and I wanted to have us um, develop these images in the river. So because it's rolled up, um, there might be layers that are touching, so I'm trying a new system for last week. Oh, you can't see this one. There are a lot of baseball caps that have the Apple logo on them, but some of them are shirts. And then others are like this, I don't know if you can see this, there's this brocade fabric that people make traditional clothing out of that you can find in many different patterns, but this one happens to have Apple. Incorporating them into the clothing is pretty common in other parts of the world, but this one in particular struck me because I had already had this on my mind about the, about the batteries. Like, were there um, other ways that the logo was used or what was clothing? In Lhasa, just coming back to my recent trip, there are some stores that are like called Apple stores, but they're clearly not official Apple stores. Like someone is just pretending that it's an Apple store. And, and coming from, I mean, coming from Mexico and like traveling into, there's this like reverence to everything that is American, like you're buying into this like to more like a utopia or this idea of being. Yeah, we're talking about um, this one place that I happen to go to, but I think this this experience of like of the the globalization of, of our consumer culture is all in a lot of places. It's yeah. not just Tibet, and I don't mean to just like be like fixated on that. It's just that's where this particular product. Is. I'm really grateful that you all were here. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to show is uh, part of the water reading uh, project. So it's a quite a nice move from one river to another uh, river. Um, oops. 
Uh, so, Faraj Day, can you uh, give us a little introduction uh, to this piece? Sure. sure. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Faraj I'm, I'm here in Miami, and, and I'm missing, missing you all in Chicago, Chicago or wherever you are. Um, um, so, so the, the water, water radio, radio project, project actually um, took, took place on, on and, and, or, and it, it's, it's continuing, continuing but, but the, the video you'll see is um, along this game, game bay, bay which, which is our, our um, access, access to, to the Atlantic, Atlantic Ocean in, in here in um, central, central Miami. Miami. Uh, which, is which is an urban, urban center, center on, the on the coast. coast. So, so we have, we have lots of inlets, inlets and, and we do have the Miami, Miami River, River, although I haven't um, done an outing on, on the river yet. yet. So, so um, in this iteration, iteration of Water Radio, radio I, partnered I partnered with an organization called O Miami, which, which is a, a um, they, do they do public art projects around, around um, Poetry, poetry and bringing, bringing poetry, poetry to the people in lots, in lots of different, different ways. ways. And, and so, so in this um, version of Water, water Radio, I took people, people out on kayaks and, and did some, some of the contemplative work that, that I do in several, several of my projects, projects my performance projects. projects. And, and we read poems, and everyone got a zine. Um, um, yeah, yeah, I think, I think you'll, you'll hear me. You'll, you'll hear me talking, talking a little bit about, about it in the video, video so I'll, I'll just let you <laughs> play that. I'm Fareshta Tusi, and along with O Miami, I invite you to reading camp. The thing that inspired Reading Camp was that I was doing these uh, forest immersion walks and I thought, well, here in Miami we're just surrounded by water and I really want to be able to take people out on journeys on the water. So I applied for the Ellie's Award through Oolite Arts and I was really uh, so grateful when I received that award because it helped to support the development of this Reading Camp project. We have a two-hour journey together, read poems, we read them together because I'm really interested in this experience of what it means to read together. And after we finish our outing, we come back on the land and we have a campfire with s'mores and um, it should be really fun, so I hope you will join us. Hello, and so this next um, piece that we're going to show you was performed um, in collaboration Hello. with the Experimental Sound My name studio. is Fereshta. I'm broadcasting to um, you so let from me, the store. Let me cut that off there. <laughs> I'm trying to have some smooth transitions today. And uh, so let me just do a quick screen change and hopefully I'm hearing that there's a little bit of an issue with the audio here. So I'm going to try, hopefully this, um, this video will, will be better, but please let me know um, in the chat if you're having audio issues, because we're really trying to sort that out. Uh, so thank you all. And uh, this is called the Crude Oil Divination by Ferej de Tudio, uh, Ferej de Tusi. Do you pick up shells and coral at the beach? Coral pieces act as a type of cylinder seal, like those ancient seals of Southwest Asia.
This seal is a magical amulet, a communication device. Sealing is an act of security, but only if you believe. If you would like to pose a question for the oil divination, you may write it in the Twitch chat. Please note that there may be a slight delay from reception to transmission and back to the reception of the, te the text. You may have also noticed some shaking in the image. This might be a part of what we are receiving. Let us begin.
thought that was a, a lovely place to end. We need more wild flowers and more wild <laughs> cauliflower. So uh, welcome for Reg Day. It's really lovely to be here with you today and to connect with you. Um, I wanted to start, our, and I also want to give a big shout out to the audience. We've had a regular group of people uh, participate in these conversations each week. And so I just want to uh, please type in your questions in the chat um, that you have for, for Eshde. So the first question that I wanted to, um, to discuss with you is uh, what, and going back to the first video that we showed today of the Lithium Diaries, which led to the second piece that you're, the, the water reading projects that you've been doing in Miami. Um, what was the inspiration for these particular projects? Yeah, yeah so, so um, um, you know, with, with the, the Lithium, Lithium Diaries project, project uh, you probably, you maybe you, it, it might have been easy to miss, but there's a, I, I talk about, um, about Tibet and Lhasa in, at the very end when we're having the conversation, and it, it really came um, directly from um, um, some travels that I had been really fortunate to do to to Tibet and to see, and I had, it had been like 10 years or more since I'd last gone and I could see the changes in the landscape um, in uh, mine pits that were there and there was this um, guide book that I was reading and it just said you know like everybody likely has a piece of Tibetan lithium in their pocket that we walk around with every day um, that is in our phone. That is um, not the only mineral or um, substance that we could, we could say that about, but it really struck me um, that, that kind of specificity of like the, the place that um, these things are from and that how, um, how easy it is to be kind of disconnected from those stories and histories and the material materiality of the, um, the products we use. And, yeah, and so um, I had been working with Jane and Mo, who I mentioned, in the, um, and we, they helped me develop this piece that I eventually um, presented with Out of Sight, and um, the, we had rented. A, so one of the one of the stocks was the storage unit, <laughs> and I was thinking a lot about like batteries because lithium is in our um, at least the way we use it in kind of everyday life um, is associated with the battery, and a storage unit is also a kind of you know a battery is a, is storing some kind of energy. So there were some meta metaphors there and um, trying to, you know, having people text and thinking about lithium not just as this, um, this substance that we use for power or energy, but also like how it's used medicinally. Um, it had, you know, um, an element isn't just one thing. It has many different, um, I would say, personalities. So getting people to think more broadly about that um, yeah, yeah, and then the and images we developed in the river were people I had met during my travels, and I, um, I wanted them to be there with us, but I also like how the cyanotype, because we just developed it kind of, um, very roughly in the river water, was not, like, a super legible or, like, you know, like a documentary style image. It was kind of, like, a messy, like, uh, there was some, there was messiness and kind of like a, I didn't want it to just be like a consumption of the images of these people who are strangers to, to, um, us or to the audience, but that it, there was some, there wasn't a legibility that, that was actually important to me. Like, I didn't want it to just be like, 
um, consuming the, this documentary um, portraiture. So that's like about um, that project and, um, you know, Water Radio came out of, um, I had been doing a lot of uh, performances uh, with walks in um, forested areas and I had trained to be a forest bathing guide and some of those principles were um, being kind of getting woven into my public performance practice, which I did a few pieces um, in Chicago. So, and then I came he to Miami um, and I realized like, well, the forest here, there's this, there's this particular um, tree habitat, the pine rocklands, which is quite threatened here. And there's still art, um, kind of like battles about whether um, uh, this very endangered kind of habitat should be raised to make a new shopping development, like that's happening. And so, um, all that is to say, we, it's not that we don't have um, kind of woodland type environments in South Florida, but they are not as present as the, the water. The, um, so I wanted to kind of, um, you know, also connect myself with this new bioregion, with this landscape that is, was quite different from the one I came from. And the, the ocean is very present in that. And so I thought, well, how can I bring some of the um, forest walk uh, practice into this other lands type of landscape? Um, so, and what's interesting is I did do a forest walk here very early on, which, which also used a type of divination, divination. Um, that, that was that was based on a divination called bibliomancy. So, so bibliomancy is when um, you would consult a book to um, oh. share the images of that. Um, is that yeah, let's in the see. PDF that you shared. I don't, I don't think, think that's, that's in the PDF, PDF but I can. I can um, Share, maybe, maybe if I, I, I can, I can if, if you want to bring up my website also, also or should I do it? Uh, well, that might add to the echo um, that oh. uh, people are experiencing. But I'm wondering, um, I thought this idea of um, storage, you know, is, is something that ties all the work together. Um, you know, you're talking, uh, I just um, attended this lecture where they talked about oil being the new data. <laughs> you know, data is the new oil. And how batteries and lithium, you know, are a form of storage. And how your, um, how, you know, we went to the storage unit um, in this project. And I'm wondering how you actually, from a performance practice point of view, you're really creating these interactive experiences for the audience. They're, sens they're sensory experiences. One of the people in the audience is asking about what kind of tea did we drink in the Lithium Diaries. And it was a herbal tea, wasn't it? Was it li was there lithium in that? Yeah. Yes, it was a it was an herbal tea. It wasn't um, there wasn't lithium in it. Uh, it was sort of a reference to like in that in that era, lithiated drinks were um, just as common as as we have kind of uh, tisanes and herbal teas for the same kind of calming, relaxing. Um, properties and, and that's, that's 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 an ancient uh, practice, uh, practice that that, that predates, predates even the lithium drinks right um so the uh i'm i'm not hearing myself anymore so i don't know if that helped the echoing <laughs> is that is that better well is that yeah i think that that, that works for me that's much better let let yeah. know if that works better. 
Um, because I've been <laughs> I've been very nutty trying to trying to ignore my own echo. I know, I know. Um, so, so yeah. it's like a chamomile, um, chamomile and other blends, you know, those kind of herbs. And, um, you know, I've heard this quote, the oil is the new data. And I, I think it goes back to a, um, a math scholar said that, oh, I don't remember their name, but, um, I actually, I think it's interesting as a starting point for a discussion. And I don't, I actually don't think that the metaphor works too well at some point because um, at this point, oil, it does have a fine, finite, there is a finite amount of it. Um, and data that I think they're referring to data as in the data we provide when we are all, um, connected in these networked spaces is not finite. It's in, like it can, can be continually replenished by us, by our bodies, by our interactions. And um, I think someone who talks about this um, really well or like can bring up maybe, well, certainly um, someone I would recommend if people are interested in this like question about data and the, the mining, I think that's another metaphor, right? The mi data mining. Um, is Ruha Benjamin, um, who wrote the New Jim Code, and um, her focus is on uh, racialized bodies in in this kind of economy of data. But um, I do because I work with a lot of digital media, and I I, I teach um, digital media. I do think that there's something interesting there. There, like, there is clearly fuel that is running all of the servers that we are here we're using um, and that becomes invisible to us um, the uh, waterways are certainly implicated there because all these cables are underwater and there's some artists who have um, addressed that too and uh, i really like this one this site um, i forget the name of it but it's like um they they have a low basically they're really interested in uh, the kind of energy that is used by a website. So they've made a website that runs on solar power. So uh, when the, when the, when the um, storage of that power is drained, like one day there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of hits or um, there are a lot of visits to the site, then the site goes offline. Like at some point it's not available and you can actually see the, the graph or the, like you can see um, the percentage of power left, and you know, I um, it's it. I don't know how that would scale up, but I really like that project as a way of drawing attention to the way in which um, we we again these um, these the energy cycles are invisible to, to us. But then, like oil ancestors is going a little bit further. Be like, I'm not. It's not so much just about the idea of, of petroleum as an energy source, but it's also trying to ask this question of like, what is, if, you know, if it wasn't for us, if humans weren't here to um, drill and use this substance, what else is going on there? Like, what is oil about beyond the fact that we as humans um, use it. It's such a powerful resource like that we don't revere in a lot of ways. And so that's, that is one element of the, you know, what I'm getting at, but, but it's almost like, well, what, you know, beyond our anthropocentric like use of it, what else is going on there to, for us to, to um, kind of connect with and understand like, um, and so that's why I, I kind of bring up this, this idea of the kinship of, of, uh, and the personhood of oil, um, like who is oil? Like what? What is it? What is oil? Um, what is oil's agency, or or like what is it trying to do? And and is it using us as an agent for that too? Yeah, I was just really um, loved the visual quality of uh, rewatching 
the, that performance and looking at how the oil depart. Uh, created these shapes and forms, which you refer to in the poem as it's coming a lot, as as the oil is forming, and how you talk about um, lecromancy as this ancient uh, way of creating uh, div divinations that that is a word that has been lost uh, through historical. Um, dictionaries it's become this erased meaning mm -hmm. and but how these defined borders uh you know were established in the oil and so i want to move on to the oil div divination uh performance that we showed today and um you're thinking about um and you just spoke about the embodied experience. And I think this is something that is a really um, important part of your work. You know, you create these interactive experiences that become embodied by the audience. And, um, you know, even in the digital realm, you know, within the oil divination uh, performance that you did in October, there was the there were uh, these elements of surprise even for me you know as the curator working with you on the project you know suddenly we were involved in this interactive composition of creating poetry in the moment and it became this uh, bodily experience for me and i'm wondering um you know you talked about that you know, in relation to oil and um, or or the how are you thinking about this this these elements of surprise that create these embodied experiences as you structure your performances? Um, yeah, I I see the my performance practice grounded in a type of experience design. So um, it very it's experience design in that there is an element that I can't predict because the audience has a lot of, of um, ability to shape the course of the the the, the live um, act that I kind of create a structure for that. And then the participants um, actually are what, you know, the, together we make something. So in the, um, in the performance I did on October 1st, you see a question come up that said, um, how do we heal the planet? That was directly from the chat. Uh, someone posted that in the Twitch chat and I repeated it. But then what I was doing was um, in the practice of lacanomancy, like this idea of um, reading the shapes of oil and water and how they form and then interpreting them, um, trying to take that question and then channel what I was seeing into <laughs> um, this digital space, which is like I couldn't, I couldn't talk to the person or like have, have a quick interaction, but they were per participating. So you know, typically in a divination, um, you know, um, someone might go to a practitioner with their questions or their concerns. And then um, a, a very common one is tarot, right? So you draw the cards and then the, the tarot reader interprets them for you, or you can do your own for yourself, right? So there's a solo practice or the, the kind of interactive version. But I'm really thinking about these as um, experiences and that I don't always know what's going to happen but there there is a sense that I've created a structure and um, this piece was also you know I had done other projects that that referred to divination before um, even actually one of my very like probably my first performance art work <laughs> uh, I did in um, in college 
it was called messages from our future selves mm -hmm. <laughs> and i did it with another student and we were basically um, typing up uh, messages for passers-by and we stationed ourselves in the mail room of, of the school um, and we actually we used a you know an analog typewriter and we had these like space sage type outfits on i don't know i hadn't really i don't think much of that project because it was you know it doesn't see it sometimes when you're sometimes your older work especially when you're much younger doesn't feel directly connected and then you start to see like these patterns of like oh even then there was this aspect of the uh this um fortune telling or future thinking <laughs> speculative thinking there but i had taken a workshop with um, a poet named ca conrad uh, not too long ago and ca conrad has a whole you know a beautiful body of work around um, somatic poetics and um, had done a little lecture for us about all the mancies <laughs> so bibliomancy lacanomancy um, they introduced me to favomancy which is the reading of beans so i'm really interested to try that sometime um, so the, and there's there's dozens of them um, but from that, I kind of wanted to, like, you know, we were asked to do some, some of our own practice, not, a, not as a way, so in that, in that, in the practice that CA Conrad um, assigned to us, the idea was to use uh, this kind of divination practice as a way to generate a lot of writing and then take that and revise it or, or, or like sit with it, um, not even revise it, but just like let it sink into you and then you create a poem that may not sound or look or read anything like the original text. So the, what, what you're seeing generated on the screen is maybe just some notes for something. I don't know if, but it, it also could be re read as the poet poem itself, like whatever was generated in this automatic writing um, performance could be, you could just leave it at that, or you could think of it as, okay, this was this was an exercise I did for myself to, to shift my perception um, and to, con to kind of meditate on a question or set of questions. And then later you might go back to um, do some writing and, and, it, and to, to see how that might um, shift how you write that day or whatever. So yeah, that all that was happening in, in how I decided to do the project. So there's a lot of uh, love in the room for you today. Oh, <laughs> and, I don't see uh, anything on the Twitch, so <laughs> thank you. Admiring uh, your work. And um, so that takes me to the question about um, how do you, um, are you, how do you structure the scores of your performances? You know, are you using, um, you know, something like the I Ching or Tarot, as you mentioned, or are you, um, how are you investigating these, how are you devising these structures? Is it through this really in-depth research that you conduct into the materials and the process it you know the the nature that you're incorporating into the conversation and the experience or is it um through another form that you're using um yeah that's a great question i don't i don't necessarily use uh, a kind of medical metaphysical practice to create the work I'm not quite there yet. Like I think I'm, I'm a little too much in my kind of logical mind to, um, to, to let that happen. Like I certainly am really invested and interested and clearly using the methods and principles of metaphysical practices. Um, some people call them occult practices in my, in my work, but, um, there's some, there's like a little 
layer of like um, kind of distance, I guess. Maybe maybe it would change over time. I don't know. So the the way that the projects are devised usually has to do with yes, some um, concern I have or interest I have in this case the questions around um, natural resource extraction and the the how that how there's so much ecological devastation we could trace that to many different <laughs> types of um, human resource um, use but in this case I focused on petroleum because I was interested in how it's connected to like the way that the relationship between Iran and and Azerbaijan uh, but also yeah so Iran and my current home country of, of America like how that that like mythology around around oil production actually re um, influenced the relationship of these two countries and that region I should say but the way it's devised is usually like thinking about who the audience is going to be, who's going to participate in the project, what kind of gifts I'm offering to them, um, how I want to um, relate to them also individually. So, so in all the works, like especially the contemplative works, it's not just that I'm a guide and I tell you what to do, I'm also doing the meditation with the participants. I, I'm part of the, the group. Um, so I'm not, I don't see myself as being a separate kind of director and then everybody is doing my um, project. Um, so there's very much like a, it's like a learning together that is happening that I'm interested in. Um, a kind of public pedagogy. <laughs> So I would like to open it up for questions uh, to the audience. Uh, so please uh, type your questions in the chat. And we have, um, there was a question that I tried to answer um, earlier on, and I just want to make sure I answered it correctly. Uh, but C. Penty was asking, what was the connection between the lithium and the photographs developed in the river. And I talked about how these were images that you collected on your travels in Tibet, and they had a connection to lithium, or or they revealed connections to consumerism, or? Well, um, there is a thread of the conversation. Basically, the uh, there's a series of photographs, portraits that I made um, of people wearing um, bootleg Apple icon clothing. So it changes over time and it's actually quite common. It's not like a big um, kind of, it's a very, it's a very natural thing. And, uh, but in that, in that, I, I, I don't think I was trying. I wasn't trying to point it out as an extraordinary practice, but um, once I saw it on the brocade fabric, uh, I was really struck by it because the brocade fabric is used for traditional clothing. So it's basically a um, like using gold uh, thread and um, it's kind of shiny. I wish I had a little sample to show you. But that would be used to make um, a traditional um, kind of gown, and it goes down to the, to your ankles, and that was a brocade fabric. And they use different patterns, but in this case, it had the apple, the kind of apple icon logo with the apple, the little bite taken out of it, and that kind of spark, sparked my interest. And I bought several yards of this fabric, and then I start, of course after noticing it, I started seeing like everybody, every teenager, everyone I was seeing was wearing baseball caps, t-shirts, all kinds of things with Apple uh, um, logo on them and taken out of context. So there was this connection, especially because we were doing the activity with the phone and thinking about our own digital devices that I was trying to bring up. And so, and also just to clarify, that this, the piece, the project, the walk started at the Apple store. 
in Lincoln Park, and we everyone was asked to go into the Apple Store and have a dialogue with the with the workers in the Apple Store <laughs> um, about the questions around the resources used to make these Apple devices. Um, so Apple was there as a kind of um, stand-in, or I should—I mean, it wasn't a project about that particular corporation, but I think it's a very iconic uh, company that has kind of a good, you know, positive feelings, positive reputation, and so that was like our our um, our our symbol of some of the ways in which our uh, we personally um, interact with <laughs> with this substance. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's great, Fereshti. Thank you. Um, so there's another, um, there's a couple more questions I'm going to read out. Um, and if you talk, can you see the comments in the chat? Because it is helpful if you can bring them up on your screen. But um, I just see a few of the recent ones now that I've clicked over there. Um, okay. It looks like so. Um, um, I missed the link and totally makes sense. And actually, I wanted to say I don't. I'm not sure who all the avatars are, but I, I when I was talking about public pedagogy, um, Claire Pentecost talks about the public amateur, and that's very much like a, that that idea of like these works are not about kind of just i'll tell you what <laughs> what you need to know about this this topic but very much like um a conversation building knowledge together um yeah and this, that, claire has written about that and i i recommend you all to read her work <laughs> yeah claire pentacles is really an unsung uh heroine of our times you know uh, so I want to read this uh, statement um, and one of the audience people is saying divination as interpretation as, in, as experience as the channel, interpretation of what you are saying, messages of our future selves. Just listening to Sarah Goodman last night talking about herself at 10 minute writing to herself at death and then losing that letter, but remembering the story yourself. And you talking a lot of reading of being. So that's a, a little comment from uh, one of the performance artists in the chat. And I have a question here from uh, Sophia Kidd. Uh, she asks, do you ever work in a Mani Manichean or a Z Zoroastrian ontologies and creative and do you use uh, creative imagination in your work? So that is a, mm. a, a, if you do, if you, I'm not too sure. I, I mean, so I'm you, not familiar with. Um, I mean, maybe if I would read the read it the the phrases, I could see that. But in terms of uh, just to. Um, pick up on Zoroastrianism. So yes, my family is from Iran and um, much of the uh, kind of philosophy and the poetry, the literature and culture of Iran is, is directly connected to Zoroastrianism. Um, I, I do believe that like, you know, and, and also in terms of like my interest in animism and this idea of like thinking about the personhood of of other beings of the others um that is very much there um kind of like that's the connection for me in terms of my own personal like my my ancestors and my heritage um i before well i i had just i've been trying to do these um recordings with my parents and asking them about about the you know relatives that they knew who I never met. Um, my my grandfather was a Sufi scholar, and um, I you know even if I like it's not like I've directly studied <laughs> um, 
those texts, I, and also, you know, generally in his, in his time, women weren't really invited into those spaces. Um, there's certainly a contemporary metaphysical practices that are totally like all inclusive, but um, just thinking about my ancestors, there's certainly something there. Like he was the caretaker for Sheikh Safi's tomb in Ardabil. And I don't, I have to do some more work <laughs> to kind of channel what that means, or maybe um, kind of really get more in touch with what and how that ha is, is influencing me. Um, but yeah, I will look back at the chat after this. I think there is usually an archive <laughs> that I can uh, check out and happy to connect with anyone by email or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So the other, um, and I just want to do a big shout out to Pasparda um, Arts and Cultural mm. Organization, who we partnered with in 2015 to facilitate um, a conversation with Iranian artists and who uh, live in Tehran. And uh, it was with Faraj Day and a couple of other artists in Chicago. And that was a fascinating conversation where we were really uh, looking at and understanding more deeply the environmental impacts um, on, on that region. Uh, so, and I just, we are um, coming to the end of a fascinating conversation today uh, with Perej Day. Uh, we've talked about this idea of storage, how lithium is, um, you know, becomes the storage within batteries, and how um, oil is another form of storage, be it metaphysical or. Um, you know, literal, and we talked about the relationship between uh, data and oil, and about the uh, live, about the embodied experience, both within digital space and within embodied interactive performances, and how Faraj Day uh, creates these uh, collective experiences uh, that. Um, you know, really are about shifting perception um, in specific relationship uh, with her research on um, to nature. And um, yeah, lots of fascinating questions from the audience. I just would like to uh, invite you all. Um, well, I just want to say that today was the last artist focus uh, conversation. Uh, because we are uh, taking some time to deal with administration and documentation before we uh, come back in the spring for the Artist Focus series, where we interview out of sight performance artists about their practice. And we are, um, and we're also organizing uh, two curated events in January and February. Uh, which will really focus on thinking about uh, interactivity and the experience. And um, I just want to share the uh, links to um, Faraj Day's work that we saw today, uh, so you can um, check them all out um, in full. And. Um, I also want to make an announcement that um, I am also a practicing performance artist uh, who focuses on using poetry, actually. And somebody uh, men mentioned um, Bavelmancy in the, in the chat. Uh, so I have a practice that is deeply embedded in interviewing people and writing poetry as a, as a gift. Uh, for the inter for the individual, and I think you know this. Um, I've through years of practice, I've understood how this actually becomes a transformative experience for the public. And I will be uh, performing tomorrow a new work that is 
hot off the press um, on Experimental Sound Studio uh, website with the field, and that starts at two o'clock. The full time. I'll be the last person up around three p.m. So please tune in and uh, watch us then. And uh, we're working on our full fundraising campaign so we can support performance artists create public performances for us next year. And I think this is going to be really um, important in terms of our, our well-being and grounding us back into nature and the environment and experience and creating these collective experiences that we're talking about. Uh, so please uh, think about uh, supporting Out of Sight and our artists. And we hope you have, uh, I'm wishing you a very special day. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, for Day, do you have anything left that you would like to see? Oh, just thank you for um, making time for this. I know there's a lot that you could be doing right now with your time. And I'm really grateful that you all showed up and anyone who's watching after the fact. And also, um, Karin, thank you for, for including me in the series. And I'm looking forward to, to more in the next season. <laughs> it, I, it's always, um, it's a real pleasure to be with you, Farajdi. Uh, your work that you're doing is um, so really has been so inspirational and transformative to me throughout my life so so thank you and thank you for everybody for tuning in and we'll see you uh, next time thank you everyone